Okay, everybody. Um, our second talk for today will be from Alberto Jimenez. 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 Yeah. Okay. Um, and he's talking about using AVS virtual tape library as storage for backlamp barriers. Yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, hello everyone. Uh, first of all, um, I'm sorry for my voice. I've been sick for a couple of weeks. But I'm now much better than a couple of days ago. I was like the son of uh, Borat's wife and uh, Christopher Nolan's uh, Batman, so I'm much better now. <coughs> so I'm going to talk to you about uh, using uh, Barrios with uh, uh, Amazon Web Services um, storage uh, service in the cloud. Okay? I will show you how to uh, configure that, how to operate that, and more or less how that's this thing work, okay? Um, first thing, a little bit of history. Why did we, uh, at my company, uh, try to, to do this setup? Um, we have a, a customer that had a, um, a legacy Bakula configuration. Uh, very, very old. Sorry. Not 5.2, it was a 3.0 Bakula, so it's very, very old. Uh, they have that in a physical data center, in a machine attached, in a physical machine attached to a to MSL uh, tape library, with 24 slots, uh, one tape drive, and, and one uh, changer robot. <coughs> the good thing was that the speed was pretty good, you know, a direct attach, so SCSI interface was very good. But first thing was a 3.0 version that we previously upgraded from. 2.4. So you can imagine, uh, maybe some of you didn't even born when this version was, was released. Uh, also, it was installed in a very ancient Red Hat uh, operating system. So ancient that it was a 4.0. It's like, <laughs> yeah, you can understand me, right? Um, not only this prehistoric stuff was installed, it was complicated to manage, to install new software, to even to update. There, there were no, no more updates for the operating system. So it was um, some risk. <coughs> we have another problem regarding the, the tapes themselves. Uh, once a week, this customer had a third-party company that um, did the, the off-site vaulting of the tapes. You know, in case a plane crashes into the data center, we want to have some small set of our data in, in a safe place. <coughs> so once a week, a guy came to the data center physically, got the tapes, uh, fit them in a, um, in a safe case, and then bring to a, to a safe bunker and store them for the next week, and then we restarted the, the life cycle again. So we were facing some, some problems. The first of them was that uh, backups just didn't finish in time. I mean, we started a full backup on Saturday, and then the next Thursday, that was the day that the guy went to the data center, the backup did not finish in time. So it was a quite huge um, data set. <coughs> so sometimes we have to call the guys and say, hey, this week there's no bolting of, of tapes because the, the backup is still running, so you can take the, the tapes. Second problem was that sometimes, um, depending on the amount of changes of our customer's database, simply the backup did not fit in the safe. I mean, they, they got a, a safe, uh, supposedly for three tapes, then we sometimes had four or five tapes. They tried to, to press the tapes against the, the safe, but sometimes it was not just possible. So we had another problem. <coughs> the last one is that for the retention uh, conditions, the whole uh, pool tape didn't fit in the MSL and uh, the offsite uh, vaulting place. So the customer sometimes had to go to the data center, get a couple of tapes, and then bring to their offices. So they have, so they had some off-site, four months off-site backup. The thing is that we had much more tapes than uh, would fit in the whole system. 
So the customer had to enter the loop, complicating things more and more and more. Okay. <coughs> Last slide of history. Not true. There's another one. Uh, we just wanted, as, as system administrators, we just wanted to upgrade the system. It made no sense to have a legacy system with a prehistoric bacula, with an antediluvian red hat, made no sense. So we wanted to upgrade to something uh, with Debian. The conditions were that uh, we were not allowed to stop backing up stuff. Uh, and the customer of course, didn't want any risks because their data is very important for them. It's very important. It's, a, it's, a, it's the core of their business. So um, we had the option of duplicating the infrastructure, get another MSL, get another physical server, install the stuff in the data center, and then um, just make it work again with a copy of, of the current infra infrastructure. <coughs> the sad thing is that those things are not usually very cheap. You know, we had to buy another set of tapes, another set, another machine, another robot, and that's not cheap. Good thing about uh, Capsite, the company I work for, is that um, we are very uh, close to the, the cloud stuff. Uh, we are Amazon partners, blah, 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 blah. And uh, we know that we know very well some some services. And there was this service called um, VTL Virtual Tape Library that was just like uh, a robot, a media changer in the cloud. Okay, it was like, hey, why not why not try it? One of the good things um, or benefits of the cloud is that uh, you can do proof of concept projects very easily and in a very cheap manner. So you just deploy the service, pay for the usage, maybe one day, two, two days, one week, and then if it doesn't work, you throw it away. Okay, you lost maybe a couple hundred dollars. So it's not, not the same as just um, purchasing for maybe one year, two years, a whole set of machines, a whole set of, of tapes, very much cheaper and, and easier. <laughs> so we started experimenting with with this BTL stuff, we hadn't used it before, so it was a, a very starting, good starting point. <coughs> so what's this service? Um, the BTL is um, a particular case of a more general service of AWS, that it's called a storage gateway service. The storage gateway service is just a service to connect on-premises your data center, uh, with uh, a storage in the cloud, okay. Um, <coughs> so you have your you have your your data center somewhat connected with um, some kinds of storage in the cloud, maybe for disaster recovery or for uh, tape archival or whatever. Okay. Uh, we have two kinds of storage gateways. The first one is the VTL that. I'm going to talk about in this talk. The second one is the volume gateway that is just like disks. You have your disks in the cloud, and then you access them uh, from your servers in your, in your data center. Okay? You can have the original data in your data center and then go uploading to the cloud, or vice versa. You can have your original data in, in, in the cloud, and then you have a, a kind of a cache in your, in your data center. Okay? <laughs> so that's what the VTL... Um, does it's just a cache of your of your backed up data, and then the system uh, goes uploading to 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 the cloud. Okay. <coughs> uh, may, I don't know if if the guys in the in the back of the room can see this this picture more or less. Um, the storage gateway VTL uh, service has three main parts. Okay, it has the um, the, uh, an appliance, it's just a virtual machine that you install on your um, ESX or Hyper-V server. It's supported, it supports both uh, virtual, virtualization options. Then you have the virtual tapes that are just like your regular tapes. And then we have the tape shelf that it's like an uh, off-site ba um, backup place. <coughs> About the, um, the VTL, 
Okay, the first part that is the one that you actually install in your uh, data center in your ESX. Uh, how does it work? <coughs> it's just a virtual machine, an appliance that AWS uh, gives you. You can download it, and you just have to deploy your your e on your ESX or Hyper-V server. It exposes the devices as iSCSI devices. So you have one media changer, and then 10 tape drives. You can use one or two or the whole, the whole set of the tape drives. It depends on your bandwidth, because if you, OK, I'm going to use all the tape drives. Yeah, OK, but then you, you need uh, some good bandwidth so all of them can upload the data to, to the cloud. <coughs> It has uh, 1,600 slots, so it's a, g a good number for playing. And then uh, 1,600 extra import-export slots that are the ones that I, I don't know if you are used to, to media changers with import-export slots. Those are the ones that when you want to extract uh, a tape, just move to that import-export ex slot, and then the, the operator just picks the tape and doesn't have to open the robot or anything else. It's like an, an automated um, eject, ejection device. Uh, why is that important? Uh, we'll see later. Uh, uh, the use of those import-export slots, OK? Uh, basically, for archival and retrieval. Remember the virtual ta tape shelf, like the off-site uh, archiving vault site? Um, when we move a tape from one regular slot to an import-export slot, automatically that virtual tape moves to that uh, off-site uh, place um, of AWS. We'll talk about it a little bit later. So, <coughs> One of the most critical things about the, the VTL, the storage gateway, is that it needs at least two disks. This is very important. Why? Uh, the VTL, the, ma the virtual machine, the, the appliance, is just like a big fat uh, buffer for your data to get uploaded to the cloud, to the remote storage. So if you, if you write a lot on your, on your um, tapes, in the end, you'll need some good bandwidth from internet to, fr sorry, from your data center to AWS. So your applications. Varios, in this case, don't have to wait for the VTL to say, hey, give me more data. I cannot upload fast enough. So <coughs> list two disks. One of them is uh, a cache, just a cache. When you want to read from your uh, remote tapes, it caches the data so you can read them again. Or when you are performing backups, um, the data is first written to the cache, and then uh, is moved to another disk that is the upload buffer that is the one that is uh, continuously up uploading the, the information to, to, the, to the actual remote virtual tapes. OK? <coughs> um, at first, uh, we, are, uh, we need to, to configure two disks, one for um, uh, cache storage and one for the upload buffer. But uh, we can add more, more, more disks um, afterwards. So, uh, we're not forced to just use two huge disks. We can use um, any one of them, any, one, any, any number of, of them. Uh, is there any questions so far about all this? No? OK. Um, what else? As I said, um, those are like big buffers, so we have to size them properly. It's critical for the throughput of our application, in, in this case, uh, Barrios, to, um, to size them so uh, we can match our application write throughput with our internet bandwidth that usually is much smaller than the, than the write throughput. So at least uh, they recommend using um, 150 gigabyte upload buffer. The cache, buffer, uh, the cache storage disk should be uh, 1.1 times the size of the, of the um, upload buffer. That's the minimum <coughs> recommended. Of course, if you want to do um, a proof of concept, you don't need to reserve 
150 gigabytes just to test that, okay? But it's the minimum recommended for, a, for an application. Anyway, uh, your, your mileage may vary. That means that maybe uh, you have a lot of uh, concurrent writes in your various setup, or maybe you are just backing up one client at a time and you don't need so much uh, amount of, of buffers, so you can size that properly. <coughs> um, what happens if... Um, ah, one thing I, I didn't remember to say. Uh, those disks can be uh, directly attached to the, to the servers, the SAX, or you can use raw uh, ISCSI device. In case you have a, a storage area network, you can uh, connect directly from your uh, VTL appliance to the remote um, disk. So you have that choice. They recommend to have direct attached disks. So the thing would be connect the uh, storage area network to the ESX, have a data store that is backed by the SAN, and then uh, provide uh, local, local disks for the virtual machine. <coughs> okay, uh, I said that you can um, add more, more disks afterwards, so we can grow our, our buffers, but uh, what happens if, for example, a disk crashed? Or there are some communication problems with our ISCSI uh, remote uh, storage area network or whatever. We need to delete them. The documentation uh, says that we can only delete uh, disks for the upload buffer, okay? The only thing is that you need to restart the VTL, the appliance. Um, they don't say that you can, well, they explicitly say that, oh, CAS, <laughs> that should be CACH, okay? Uh, they say explicitly that uh, CACH disk deletion is not supported, but we had uh, this situation where we needed to actually delete that disk, and in fact, it makes sense what happens is if the disk crashes or happens, uh, shit happens all the time. So what happens with that? We contacted AWS support, and they confirmed that even when the docs uh, said otherwise, we can uh, delete um, uh, cache uh, storage. <coughs> the only problem... Uh, problem is that uh, the cache must be reset. What does that mean? When you configure uh, upload buffers or, or cache uh, storage disks, in the interface of the, uh, of the VTL in the AWS console, you, you can choose uh, this disk is for upload buffer, this one is for cache, this one is for upload buffer, and then pff, everything gets summed up and you get the whole space for you. The thing is that after deleting this uh, one of those disks, the cache must be reset. That means that the VTL forgets about all its uh, cache disks, uh, and then you have to reconfigure again and restart. You, you have to even restart the, the machine in the, in the ES, ESX server, not just the, the service. So it's like a, a, huge, uh, a huge thing. <coughs> uh, what happens when, when we reset the, um, the cache? We must be sure that it's clean. So there's no problem on resetting the cache. It's just a cache. It's uh, already uh, data that is already in another place. But the thing is that the cache must be clean, okay? We have uh, two CloudWatch metrics. Uh, does anyone know what this CloudWatch? No? CloudWatch is the, the internal... Sorry? Oh, sorry. I'm, I heard voices in my head. Uh, CloudWatch is the internal uh, monitoring service of, of, of AWS. All internal metrics of uh, all the services are uh, saved for like 15 days or something like that, and you have a lot of metrics for, for, for a couple, uh, all the services. And um, the storage gateway has a bunch of them, but the two most important, uh, not only for uh, making sure that the, the cache is clean, but for just uh, checking how is your service working, are the uh, upload buffer used. So if you get 100%, uh, it's a good sign that you should add more capacity to your upload buffer. And the cache percent dirty. So if you plan to delete uh, some cache disks, you should wait, uh, stop any activity on the VTL, uh, stop the storage daemon or, or the whole uh, director or whatever. 
wait for those things to go zero, and then you can do whatever you can. <coughs> I've, um, in the past, I found some problems. Uh, just a warning. I haven't the chance to, to actually try to, to reproduce, but I found that um, maybe for this thing, in the past, when I was young and was like crazy, and I, let's try things, uh, my tapes got corrupted. I think that it's because of the the cache was not was was dirty. So the thing is that the tapes uh, were there, but when I tried to to mount in 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 Bakula in that case, uh, it said it has a label, but it's not a Bakula label. So uh, beware if you want to try things out. Okay. <coughs> so the second second component of the of the whoa, 20 minutes already wow second component is the virtual tapes they are just um, like your uh, good old physical tape drive, uh, tape uh, cartridges uh, we can choose from um, 100 gigabyte to 2.5 terabyte <coughs> and the thing the key thing here is that though the data is backed in S3 S3 is the um, main storage uh, service uh, from AWS, from Amazon. Uh, it's like a, a huge uh, unlimited storage. Uh, it's quite cheap compared, compared to, to, um, to, um, <coughs> to some other options. And it has uh, 11 nines of durability. And I think that uh, four nines of availability. So for durability, uh, it's pretty cool, S3. That's why they chose to, to store things in, in S3. And another good thing of S3 is that you pay only for what you use. You can create a tape of uh, 100 gigabyte, but if you, you don't write anything to the tape, you won't pay anything. Okay? You only will pay for the, 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 the gateway uh, service, that it's like $125 a month, and then for the storage you are using. <coughs> um, some boring numbers. Uh, you can have up to uh, 1,500 tapes uh, in a single storage gateway. You can have more than one, of course. And uh, all the data stored in that gateway, gateway can be uh, um, more than uh, 150 uh, terabytes. So if you need more, more, more data, just get another gateway connect another uh, storage daemon, and then you will have 300 terabytes, okay? Uh, the, the tapes, how do you create, destroy, and archive tapes? You can use the, the web console or the API, okay? Uh, in AWS, in general, everything is managed via the API, everything. So uh, you can make API calls to create a tape or destroy a tape or whatever. Uh, in fact, I don't know if you've ever used some AWS services, but the console, the application where you log in and, and move stuff around, it's not anything special of AWS. It's just a web application that makes API calls for you. You could write that application by yourself. So the, 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 um, the important thing here is that uh, you can do everything using the, the API. Okay. <coughs> And the last one is the is the virtual tape shelf. It's just like an an an, an offsite um, offsite place. It's not in S3. It's stored in another storage service called uh, Amazon Glacier. That for the name you can you can infer that Glacier. It's like something that does not move. Okay. It's like for data that is uh, not accessible. Um, you won't access it for a long time. You won't delete it for a long time. It's like a tape archival off-site vaulting place. Okay. <coughs> uh, the good thing about Glacier is that it uh, is much cheaper than S3. It's like four times uh, cheaper, uh, more 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 cheap. Uh, the bad thing, uh, as as any other, I'm sorry, my mic is okay. Uh, like, for example, in an analogous physical world, when you have to recover some tapes from your off-site bolting uh, site, you have to call the guys and, hey, bring me some tapes, and then I will put them to the, to the robot uh, 24 hours. So when you restore 
a tape from the archival place, <coughs> uh, you need to wait for 24 hours. Um, the virtual tape shelf, as you can see in this, uh, just forget about this, this should, is like a second data center. Uh, the thing is that for the same account, and in the same region, region are like geographic places of AWS, independent one from, from each other. You have here uh, Frankfurt, and there in Europe there's uh, Ireland, so uh, you shouldn't be worried by that. Uh, the virtual tape shelf is uh, the same for all the storage gateways. So if you have more than one storage gateway uh, provi uh, provisioned, uh, you have to choose when you restore a tape to what um, storage gateway it will be inserted in the, in the robot. Okay? <coughs> so how do we use this, this thing? In the physical world, we just call the guy and, hey, extract the tape and then uh, put it in the safe and uh, bring it somewhere else. Uh, we can say, hey, Mr. Amazon, uh, take my virtual tape and take the and USB and, okay, so how do we manage that? Those are the 1600 uh, import export slots for. When we move uh, from uh, Barrios, for example, from a tape drive or a regular slot to one of the import export slots, automatically the tape gets ejected and it gets saved or stored or archived in the, in the virtual tape shelf. Uh, the same for the reverse thing. When we recover via API or via console, I want to recover this tape uh, for this storage gateway, uh, AWS automatically makes it appear 24 hours later <laughs> in one of the import-export slots. So we can then move to a regular slot or to a tape drive or whatever we want to do with the, <coughs> with the tape. Okay? There's only one, one catch, that when we retrieve a tape from a virtual tape shelf, it's read-only. Okay? This is um, a behavior uh, because of how Glacier works. Glacier is a read-only storage, so you can modify data in Glacier. And now your, your faces are like, read-only tapes? What the fuck, man? What happens with my, with my life cycle that I want to, to recover my tapes and then uh, start again the cycle of append status and such? <coughs> and I'm going to talk to you about uh, the, this thing. This thing is in the cloud, okay? And uh, if you want to move to the cloud or, or, or make a good use of the cloud services, you have to... Um, make some uh, mind shifts, okay? One of the best practices of, 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 of the cloud or moving to the cloud is embrace the constraints. So uh, when you see a limit, um, instead of fighting it, you can try to change your mindset and be more creative. So we have this limitation, okay? Uh, if we want to go full uh, VTL, uh, we have to embrace that limit. Okay, not fight um, again that. And then I will ask you a question. Why do we love tapes? Why that, does that plastic uh, case have, uh, so we love that tape and want to recover that and I don't want to lose? Those are um, tapes that uh, over time, they decay, uh, they'll have right errors. So why do we want to recover that tape and then put that in the loop again? We should love the data inside the tape, not that plastic stuff, okay? So uh, <coughs> we have to change uh, how do we think about tapes. Uh, the left image is a garden. The right image are crops. So in, in the cloud uh, world, we talk about crops. Servers are not like pets. We don't give names to servers. Tapes are not pets. We don't uh, hug our tapes. Oh, I love you so much. No, I love you. The data it's inside. We don't treat them like with with um, carefully. We just say, "Hey, server does not work. I'll shoot it in the head and spin up another one." The same happens for tapes. The tape ended its life cycle, so I just delete the tape and then start with another one, because 
in the, in the first place, that's what we did with physical tapes. Just delete everything in the tape and then started writing again on it. Okay? <coughs> but uh, we lose the various uh, managed life cycle that is a pretty nice thing. Okay? It's like some balance between uh, what one, what we can do with that. And now, uh, you, maybe you understand my question yesterday in the workshop about, hey, can we do, can we write plugins based on time-based uh, events? Maybe when uh, there's an event that a tape is full or whatever, we can uh, launch a trigger to, hey, uh, move it to the VTS and then after some time, uh, just delete the data and create a new tape. That's why I yesterday I was asking about all that stuff. That's not um, today. It's not. Um, we have not solved this this thing currently. Uh, we are manually making this this cycle. Uh, we are working on trying to write some scripts or or try to understand the the plugin in, um, infrastructure. So to check if we can automate that, but. <laughs> That's the the, <coughs> the thing today. Okay. Any question? No. So now for for the setup, how do we create this uh, in in the AWS um, console? How do we create this service or how do we provide the service? Uh, it's actually it's it's, it's pretty easy. <coughs> we go to the to the service in the console. Uh, maybe if I have some time, I don't know if. I'm on time. Okay, thank you. So uh, we just go to the console. I don't know if, if any of you is, is comfortable with, with the console or, or ever seen the console. Just go to the service and then click on a button that says deploy ne new storage gateway. When we choose the type, in this case the VTL uh, storage gateway, uh, they give you the, the VM template for your uh, hypervisor. ESX or uh, Hyper-V, uh, it's like a, a gigabyte uh, OBF, so you can then upload to your, to your, to your hypervisor, uh, you deploy the appliance, uh, side note, you deploy your backup server, it's another machine, so this machine is just the appliance that exposes the ISCSI um, uh, devices, and then you activate the gateway. It's just registering, the, hey, I have this machine on my premises, this is, will be the one that will be uploading data to S3 and, and Glacier and, and such. <laughs> okay, once we have um, this, this uh, appliance working, uh, we have to configure Bareos. How do we configure that? It's just much more easy. You just install the ISCSI uh, initiator, initiator tools, in Debian, it, uh, the package is called OpenISCSI. And then you discover the targets. Uh, this would be your internal, uh, the internal IP of, of, your, of your appliance. It's a local network. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> and then you log in to each of This discovery will uh, spit out a bunch of, of devices, uh, the 11 devices, the, the media changer and the 10 tape drives. And then you can log in, you can connect uh, to all the targets you want. If you just want to use one tape drive, just log into one tape drive. If you want the whole 10, you can do it for, for every one of them. Uh, recommendation. <coughs> In the end, <coughs> sorry, this VTL thing is just uploading data uh, through the internet. So we have limited bandwidth. Uh, if we have problems uh, with our connection, this VTL will stop responding, and then our BIOS server will stop responding. So it's uh, recommended to uh, increase the default uh, ISCSI uh, timeouts. Okay. <coughs> then, after connecting to the <coughs> to the devices, you can check that uh, on your on your BIOS server, you can see the the, the new the new devices. Hey, look at me. I'm a medium changer. Dev SSH0. Okay. But here is where the, problem, the first problem uh, strikes you. MTX is, uh, is a program that is used to manage uh, media changers. It's the guy that actually 
knows how to get the robot from one slot to another slot. And uh, this is being used by Barrios in the end. Well, Barrios uses, a, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, uses a wrapper script that in the end is calling this guy. This guy is so nice that uh, if you try to, to manage this nice uh, device file name, says, hey, no, I know what you're talking about. I'm just uh, prepared to work with uh, SCSI generic uh, devices. Then you go man MTX and it says, control SCSI media, not generic. Uh, what the fuck, man? Why is this so broken? Okay, so <coughs> it's okay. No problem. You want generic devices? I will give you generic devices. In the previous slide, this is the generic device that um, is the same device as the other one, but uh, the kernel just uses another driver to manage the, the interface with the, with the device. There's no, <coughs> no problem. So, okay, you want generic uh, devices? I will give you generic devices, no problem. Dev SG4. Um, so we go to Barrios and then configure the auto changer device, dev SCG4, and that's it. Really? Not so easy. Because I don't know if you remember that good old days of a make node and make dev that you had to you install your Linux system and then, okay, have a, a ID, no SCSI, <laughs> hard drive, and Make note, uh, major number, minor number, uh, that was a nightmare. Nowadays, the kernel is prepared to auto-detect and auto-configure all the devices that are connected to, to our system. <coughs> and the, the boot scripts just detect them and assign uh, numbers or, 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 or names uh, dynamically. So, put yourself in the, in the body of the boot time scripts I connect to ASCSI devices, I get 11 devices all at the same time, and I start, oh, oh, oh you're one, you're two, uh, you're three. So the thing is that in the end, every time we reboot our server, usually those numbers change. So we can't have uh, a fixed name in our configuration, and that's not good uh, for Bakula, okay? <coughs> So that's the thing. You restart your, your machine, and then Bakula stops working. Why? <laughs> this is why, OK? OK, so what can we do? Uh, I know some, some older magicians that know how to uh, cast spells. OK, so uh, they gave me a secret spell that works. Nobody knows why or how, but it works. Well, the thing is that uh, this is a UDEV rule. UDEV is the, the subsystem that is in charge of actually giving names and numbers to all the devices that the kernel sees connected to, to our system. <coughs> With uh, UDEV rules, you can um, do stuff uh, depending on the, the features of that uh, devices, or those devices, sorry. Uh, in this case, we just say, hey, if this is a media changer, uh, type of um, SCSI device, um, do some secret stuff, and then, hey, create a new link under dev that will be called AutoChanger. You can give it, uh, you can give any name you want. It's not, must not be AutoChanger. But uh, this is the thing that, that you have to put in somewhere inside this directory. <coughs> the name is not, meaning, is not meaningful, so you can do anything. You, uh, you can name it any, uh, any as you want. Uh, and then, when you reboot, uh, you will have this magic dev auto changer that will be always called dev auto changer and will always point to the correct uh, actual device file. Okay. <coughs> okay. Uh, we have the auto changer configured with a fixed name. Okay. But what happens with, with tape drives? The thing is that the default uh, UDEV rules, at least in Debian, is the system I've been trying, um, that there, there are actually rules for, for, for a tape changer. The thing is that uh, those rules are horrible. 
So they create a, a strange name in a strange directory, and then it doesn't even point to the auto-changer device. It's like, it's not useful at all. So that's why we have to write our own uh, rule for the auto-changer. In this case, the, the default UDEV rules are okay. So they work properly, they set up the, the correct links, as long as you're okay with this kind of device names to put in your configuration. Okay, uh, dev tape, bypass, IP, whatever, blah, 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 SCSI, blah, blah, blah. okay? You, al you always have the option of using the, the, the generic uh, path, dev, sg, one, two, three, or whatever. The thing is that you will not uh, know if that is the first tape, tape drive or the second or the third. So I think that uh, of this, of this uh, bunch of stuff, the only thing you're used is this NST, that rings a bell, right? So we have uh, it exposes the both both um, versions, the non-rewinding and the rewinding. So in this case, it's a virtual tape, so not rewinding. That's okay. <laughs> okay, getting there, we have the the devices available, so we can configure our BIOS installation. <coughs> and now it's like uh, you will we, you will have this. Uh, more, more, more easier than I. Uh, those last slides are just uh, for filling some time because you will know how to configure iSCSI uh, devices. So the thing is that in the storage daemon, uh, we just uh, define the tape drives. You can define uh, any number you want from uh, 1 to, to 10. Just uh, choose that. The media type, as you know, it's an arbitrary string that we can put anything there. I chose this name because when you create uh, a storage gateway in AWS, uh, it puts you uh, what kind of hardware it's simulating. So it's uh, an IBM, Ultrix, uh, blah, blah, blah. So I put the media type, the same string, and that's it. Okay? <coughs> we are part of an auto-changer, and <coughs> the auto-changer uh, resource uh, just change your device, yay! We don't have to change it anymore. And then we choose uh, which tape drives uh, we want to use. Uh, <coughs> playing with the configuration, you can, for example, uh, reserve uh, one or two drives for full backups that maybe take more time and need more... Um, um, at writing at the same time. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, and then you can reserve another drive for incremental backups that are independent from the full backups, and you don't have uh, incremental jobs waiting for full backups to, to end. So you can, you can play with, with, with the configuration. So this is the guy that, in the end, calls the MTX, uh, the, the SCSI changer that does not know how to uh, manage SCSI things in its generic... Um, uh, devices. <coughs> okay? <coughs> and then uh, the director just uh, set up the, um, the storage. Please don't, don't look at this. Okay? This is just a proof of concept a virtual machine. Uh, the VTL, and then we match, we link the, our director configuration with the, the actual storage configuration via the media type and the device, as you, as you may, may know uh, by now. <coughs> and then uh, the last thing we have to do. We have the pools, we have the devices, we, ha we have everything set up. Just say, Bakula, hey, for those jobs or for those clients, uh, use this, um, this backing uh, storage as you, as you want to, to use that. Okay. Um, any questions so far? Really? I'm doing so bad that nobody has questions? So one thing I liked a lot when, when I tried uh, Barrios is that uh, the V console itself uh, is able to manage the auto changer. That that is not true, at least uh, regarding the documentation for the latest version of Bakula. The thing is that uh, in the in the console you have uh, import, export, and move. So you can move tapes from the import export slots to regular slots and vice versa, and then you can move around tapes in the auto changer slots. As uh, Bakula knows how to, how to manage the changer 
we can from inside uh, Bakuda or Barrios uh, move the, the, the slots. One thing that um, I tried is that even when you're inside the, the B console and you move around tapes, um, the, the catalog information is not updated. That may be one patch request, <laughs> and you have to update the slots manually. Okay? The same happens when you create a tape. What happens when you create a tape, a brand new tape? Um, AWS puts it in one of the import export slots, and then uh, you move the tape to a regular slot, and then uh, you do the label, barcode, slot, blah, 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 blah. Okay? <coughs> and a cool thing is uh, this uh, status slots. I'm not sure if this is documented in the, in the inline help of of B console or, or, in the, or in the documentation, I'm not sure. But uh, if you say help status from inside the B console, I don't think that this slots uh, keyword is, is, is present. This shows like an MTX status. So it shows you the chip drive, uh, no, not the chip drive, only the slots. The slots and, and the, um, the tapes that are in the slots and uh, the pool uh, of the tapes. So it's Pretty cool, pretty cool. <coughs> so, um, now, uh, um, questions? Please make some questions. Yeah. Um, I, I find the uh, AWSS3 pricing uh, very hard to understand. It's not only the amount of storage being used, but also they cover for the transfer. Yeah. And that's um, also different for. How do you have some uh, idea? Well, um, AWS has this thing called a uh, simple calculator. Mm. The simple is just because they like to write down simple. It's not simple at all. Uh, we have uh, the salespeople, when we, have, uh, when we um, propose to our customers, uh, hey, move to the cloud, they say, OK, how much will it cost? They have never been able to, uh, inputting the same uh, values to that calculator, have the same price twice. So it always changes. It's not simple. The thing is that you have the storage um, cost. Then, um, in general, for, a for AWS, in um, inbound traffic is for free. So when you put stuff in AWS, it's for free. What they charge you for is when you extract data or stuff from AWS. You, um, how do you calculate that? Uh, you have a, an amount of data that, that you will recover from the VTS, uh, sorry, uh, VTL, multiply by the days, and that's the price. Then you have that um, price per API calls, that it's ridiculous, it's like uh, three, three tenths of cent, so 0 0.003 uh, per 5,000 API calls, that it's ridiculous, so. It's not something to, to worry about. Yeah, but the transfer is, is like that. Input transfer, so data that you uh, push from your VTL appliance to AWS will be for free. OK? And the only thing you, they will charge you for is when you want to uh, restore uh, something. Um, so the, the Glacier um, thing is um, in the Yeah, end that's, that's the, the complex one to calculate. More yeah. different. <laughs> yeah, it's like. Wow, yeah, it's a nightmare. Um, <coughs> the thing is that when you, uh, it's, uh, the storage itself is much cheaper. It's like four times cheaper. Um, deleting stuff from Glacier is for free if you delete stuff uh, that is older than 90 days. So if you delete that before the 90 days, they charge you. Uh, Re uh, depending on how many days you had that in Glacier, it's like, yeah, it's a nightmare. It's, it, it's, ma it's sick to understand. And the traffic, uh, I'm not sure about how much do they charge, but uh, thinking about it, maybe could be free, because a Glacier is like tied to S3, so moving things from S3 to, S to Glacier, it's not actually very expensive. So in the end, how, how much time does your customer run this now? Uh, re they replaced a traditional tape library by 
this and uh, so they did no longer need uh, the service company to <coughs> attach the tapes and all that stuff. Uh, did it turn out in the end that it is uh, uh, cheaper from the cost perspective? I mean, it's for sure more practical to use, uh, but is it also it's, cheaper it's, in the end? Well, it depends on how do you how do you count mm -hmm. that. I mean, uh, the, our customer particularly um, had the, the the hardware. It's very old. Had it paid for it a uh, long time ago. So uh, they have uh, amortized. Amort well. The thing is that they currently the, the current infrastructure is for free for them yeah. because they're just paying power to the data center, the, the rack uh, space, and, and that's it. I'm not sure how much they are paying right now. I think they are like $400 a month, mm. more or less, and they have quite a bunch of, of data there. But it's, it's not easy because uh, with AWS in general, you pay per month. So I use that, I pay for that. If you have a physical traditional data center, you pay like in advance uh, a bunch of months or, or even years, and then there's some point in time that uh, you have paid for it, so it's free for you to, to maintain that. Yeah. It's not easy to... Yeah, sure, you have no initial cost for buying uh, no, 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 tape no. library hardware. You that's, pay the, that's the good thing. Monthly. And yeah. the good thing about a proof of concept uh, project, that, hey, I want to, to try this thing out, like I did. Hey, I want to try this for this customer. customer. I think that it will, will match. Then it's like uh, $125 a month for the, for the service itself, and then start uploading stuff that in S3 is maybe $20, $30 a month for a, for a test. So, one last question is, uh, how, how do you handle encryption? Because we, nobody wants to store uh, <coughs> you have, you have non-encrypted data in, in the cloud. You have two options. As the VTL is in, on your premises, uh, traffic from uh, barrios to the VTL can be encrypted, or you can encrypt in the FD using the native uh, encryption. Uh, of course, traffic from VTL to AWS goes encrypted, Okay, all, ser all AWS services go uh, via HTTPS or encrypted. And then in S3, uh, you have the option of uh, encrypt at rest. So when, when they store your data in their physical disks, uh, they store that encrypted. Uh, well, uh, they are certified. They are cert certified. Maybe they have uh, a lot more certification. Yeah, they are certified, but the NSA doesn't care about that. So. Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, honestly, I would not uh, store my backup data without encrypting it myself. Because, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. It's, of course, uh, you cannot fact, trust it's, anybody. It's, a, it's an option. So they, they don't try to, to, to fool you and say, no, no, uh, I will encrypt that for you. Don't do anything. No, no. They say, hey, you can encrypt that. Uh, I, I don't care. If you want my services that I encrypt for you, I will do that. And they are certified. And um, I know this because uh, we, we are partners with, with, with AWS. We are not part of AWS, so don't, don't get me wrong here. So I don't have anything with them. I, I just know quite well how do they work. And I can assure you that they have uh, more certifications uh, than any of your physical data centers can get. I can assure you that. So if you're, if you're not comfortable that I understand that you are not, uh, maybe I wouldn't be. <laughs> Uh, you can always encrypt your data and then upload in, in, encrypted. There's no problem in doing that. Uh, does the VTL device also support the LTO4 encryption, uh, or the hardware encryption? Because an LTO4 drive and higher does uh, uh, LTO no, encryption. No, it doesn't support hardware encryption. Yet, or are they thinking um, about adding that? I, I, I don't know the roadmap. But I mm -hmm. think that this is a quite stable service. I don't mm -hmm. think they, they plan to add more features okay. to the service. Any other question? OK, then thank you. OK, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.